Good morning. I, as uh, Sam said, I'm here representing the U.S. Forest Service. I, I bring, uh, I, I think, a, a rather unusual experience to to the the uh, discussion here. I I worked for a, a time for two mining companies early in my career for uh, Kennecott and, and for Noranda, a, a Canadian company. I worked for the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, which is a resource evaluation agency, and then for an oil company for a while. But the balance of my career has been with the United States Forest Service, about 26 years. And then uh, after retirement, I continued to do work for the Forest Service, and, and my other consultant consultancy has involved some work with NGOs. So I, I think I've seen kind of a, a broad spectrum of the interested parties in the, in the discussion. Uh, you might wonder why uh, the Forest Service is involved in, in minerals. Uh, even though it's called the Forest Service, it's a multiple use agency, meaning that uh, a variety of uses happened on that land. And it, it's a very large land base, 78 million he hectares or 193 million acres of land, very large land base. and. Um, uh, mining is allowed and encouraged. Uh, there, uh, there's a national policy and a Forest Service policy that I'll talk about in a bit that, that uh, provides for this. But however, it's a caveat is they must comply with strict environmental rules. How do I just down arrow here? Um, my home is uh, in the state of Montana. Uh, my family has <clears throat> several generations been there, so I'm, I'm very long time based in that state. I can understand the attachment that Levon expressed with the love for, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, uh, the landscape and the land. Uh, the state, uh, its motto is the treasure state, and that's based on the fact that it experienced 144 years of mining. And parts of it are similar to Armenia from what I've seen at the country and <coughs> driving down from Georgia. And we have a mix of old and new mines. Uh, there's a, a legacy of, of, of mines that we're dealing with. Uh, and and I, I'll mention it a bit in a, a later, but we have all kinds of mines. We have open pit mines uh, shown here. This was, is a very large mine complex good part of it legacy, some of it new that's it's occurring, and it, it occurs uh, upstream on a river system above where I live. This is my, t my home here in Missoula, Montana. So that's an older style mine that happened before we develop regulations. Uh, this is a newer mine that's relatively uh, recent. It's, it's a, a platinum palladium mine underground um, and uh, it, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about it, but it's, I would say it's a model of a modern mine, the sort of mine that we would like to see occur on the land. Just to give you an idea of the land base I'm talking about, the Forest Service manages a, a good amount of the land in the West. Uh, most of our, our country is still owned by the federal government. Some states like Montana, 40% of it is owned by the federal government. A state like Nevada, which is a big mining state, uh, I think is 90% of the state. So the federal government has a big role in, in mine permitting. The Forest Service also manages lands in the eastern part of the country. That's mostly coal mining. Most of the metal mines that I'll be talking about are in the west. Um, and speaking of mining, I. I one inventory I saw was that there are about 4,000 to 5,000 mines on, on these lands. That was as of about 1997, and half of those were coal. Um, oh, and by the way, the Forest Service, uh, just to give you an idea of the role it plays in mining, uh, the biggest coal mine in the United States is managed by the Forest Service. It's 25% of total U.S. coal production comes from a big mine here in, in Wyoming. Um, part of the, just to give a prelude to some of the issues I'll talk about, the same forces, geological forces that created this landscape, this 
the beautiful land of trees and, and mountains and lakes and so on are the same geological forces that created the ore deposits. So therein lies the, the conundrum. And oh, just in, in the interest of uh, our 50th state, which is not on the map here, Alaska, which is a, our, one of our states, is not on the map. It actually takes, it's about equivalent in size to 20% of the United States. It's up here off the map. But it also has a, a large mining uh, uh, industry. We, we have a national minerals policy which lays out as a nation what we regard as important. And based on that uh, national policy, the uh, Forest Service has further stated as to how that will apply to, to Forest Service lands. And these are, are the key points that I'd direct your attention to. One is to encourage responsible mineral development while protecting other resource values. The, the idea is that you need to have both, just one is not enough. Providing access to minerals that are important to local and national economic growth, this gets to national security issues. Again, to reclaim and return lands to productive uses, to apply uniform protect, protection standards and update those based on scientific research. And last but not least, maintain a force, workforce of trained professionals to oversee the mine operations. That's, that is critical and I'll say more about that. Uh, I'm sorry this is a bit washed out, but uh, I, th what this map shows is these are large gold, silver, and platinum mines as of 1997. And if you count these up plus Alaska, you get around 100, 150, and those would be mines around 3,000 tons per day or larger. And if, you, if I zoom in on this spot here, I just want to show you how things have changed and grown in the United States. If you go into that spot there, uh, that's this area. This is an area that's about uh, 25 square miles. I'm not sure what that is in kilometers, but uh, uh, say 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers in size. This small area now has 26 mines. And uh, they're open pit like this and largely uh, cyanide heap leach. So we've, this is, uh, 2013, so in 17 years we've, we've really had quite a growth. And, and we've learned a lot in the process, the land management agencies, about the issues and I, I think we're doing a better job certainly than we did initially. I want to go through a few examples. I've got to put a mix in here. I'm not giving you just the good side. I'm giving you a mixture. This is our large molybdenum mine, Thompson Creek. It's on the National Forest in southern the state of Idaho. It's a conventional uh, milling process with a, a concentrator and, and flotation, and thus it has a, a very large tailings dam. The tailings dam um, is, because it's a seismically active area, we were very concerned about how it would be constructed. Ultimately, we approved a centerline design, which Rick can attest is, is certainly better than an upstream constructed design. Uh, the tailings, uh, our initial calculations were that they would be largely inert, that is they would not be generating any acid or leaching. We did develop late in the process a small amount of acid rock drainage coming out of the toe of this and so we've had the company build a coffer dam to catch that and to pump that contaminated water back into the tailings impoundment, and if that continues, we will require water treatment in, in perpetuity or as long as the water is a problem. But the point is to not allow that to contaminate ground or surface water. This is another mine. It's, it's closer to my home. Uh, it's in the northwestern part of the state of Montana on national forest lands. Um, it's an underground mine, a very large one. It's a room and pillar type. Uh, mining for silver and, and copper. Again, it's a traditional uh, concentration flotation process. The, the tailings are slurried down the mountain into a, an area in the valley. Uh, it's been a, a, a pretty good mine. We approved this in 1978, which was early after our regulations uh, came into being, which were our, our modern mining regulations were developed in 1974, by the way. 
So overall, the performance of this mine has been pretty good, and the company has been, our, our initial reclamation plans weren't as good as the ones we do now, but still things have proceeded well, and good parts of the tailings have been reclaimed as mining has progressed. So uh, uh, only part of the tailings impoundment is unreclaimed at this, at this point. We had a recent incident which opened our eyes to another issue that we're going to consider in the future for these types of mines. We had an earthquake in, 19, or, uh, in December of last year which caused some of these pillars to fracture and collapse and that caused some surface subsidence and so uh, in, there are additional mines proposed of this style. So we are going to, we're looking carefully at that right now and we're going to be requiring stricter mitigation to avoid that. But as I said, there have not been water quality issues of significance with this project. This is one I've mentioned earlier, the East Boulder Platinum Palladium Mine. There are actually two major mines operating in this zone. It's a 34 kilometer mile, or 34 kilometers long ore zone. So it's a huge uh, platinum palladium resource, um, 100 years plus. And uh, for a while it was, it was owned and operated by a Russian company, Norilsk. Since then, uh, that has changed and it's now a, a wholly owned public company that's operating it. Um, it's an underground mine, as I said, in flotation and constructed with a constructed tailings impoundment built entirely out of, of borrow material so stability isn't a concern. It's had good water. The only issue that of, of note has been nitrates in the water, and that comes from the blasting compounds that are used in the mining process, and, and those are being treated through biological means and, and land application. One thing I want to point out about this project that I think serves as a model is that the mining company faced strong opposition. You can see this is a beautiful area. It's next to a wilderness area. It's right close by Yellowstone National Park. So the, the NGOs were very concerned about this going in. The company had a very far-sighted uh, chief executive officer, in my opinion. And so they entered into a formal agreement with the NGOs called the Good Neighbor Agreement. This is a legally binding enforceable contract, and essentially what it did was it threw open the company's books to the NGOs. The NGOs were able to come in to take samples, to inspect the monitoring, and the company since then has put them through the same training program as far as the environmental uh, treatment and monitoring as their own workers. And as a result, the controversy, the confrontations have, have gone away. And one other mine uh, is, is uh, implementing that as well. This is the Golden Sunlight Mine, uh, open pit. It uses a, a cyanide in its process. It's a vat leach, meaning instead of a heap leach, the rock is crushed and run through vats where the, uh, there's cyanide solution. It dissolves out the gold, and the gold then is uh, absorbed onto an activated charcoal and later extracted. As a result, it has a tailings impoundment that, that must be dealt with. Uh, as you can see by the red color, there, there is acid generated, and, and acid come, it's a natural process. Anytime you see red rocks like this in a, in a mining area, that, that means you probably have a reaction going on. And the sulfur minerals, pyrite being one of them, also called fool's gold, is one of the main culprits. It reacts with oxygen and water to generate acid, and it can affect the water quality as well as leach other minerals out that can be of water quality issues. So in developing this big open pit, the waste rock also was potentially a problem. So the, the waste dumps are on the back side here. The company did a good job of designing the dumps in a way to minimize acid generation and as Rick said, to cover it, to put a cover to keep water and oxygen out and to revegetate it. Um, the main concern here is this pit is going deeper and deeper into the groundwater. Ultimately, you can see here in the bottom, there will be a pit lake. The pit lakes are a problem because they are a very long-term water quality problem, and we've, we've uh, struggled with how to address that. How we are addressing it here in this mine is that 
the company, Golden Sunlight Mine, I think it's owned by Barrick, will, has put money into a trust. And that trust will provide for <coughs> perpetual treatment of the water in this pit. Uh, and, and it's a sort of bonding only for a very long term. Perpetuity is a very long time. <laughs> um, these are just the, the facilities. These are the tanks through which the ore is, is run. Beal Mountain Mine is a unusual. It, it's a heap leach, cyanide heap leach. It sits up on top of a mountain. Um, it, it was unusual in the standpoint that the company which operated this went bankrupt uh, along the way. And uh, they were not a US company. They were, I think, their bankruptcy problems related to problems elsewhere. And um, so the US Forest Service had to take the reclamation bond that we had required to reclaim it. And in reclaiming it, uh, some interesting issues came up. One is in reclaiming and capping the heap leach itself, we discovered that, that the original design had not adequately provided for the water balance. What do I mean by water balance? It had not considered the, the amount of snow. You get 12 to 15 feet of snow up here, about, and that in the spring melting, rain on that, you have a larger volume of water to deal with than you would have expected. So that meant that more water to be treated. In addition, uh, in designing this facility, there, there is a, an embankment here, a retaining wall that the uh, heap leaches were built up against. That retaining wall was built out of locally extracted materials, and, and we thought it was inert, but we didn't sample it well enough or require the company to sample it well enough. It turned out it was not acid generating, but it had uh, high levels of selenium in it which became a problem as this was, water was draining, it was picking up selenium and carrying it into the stream. So that was a lesson learned. We should have, re in future, we are requiring sampling and characterization of all rock that will be disturbed at a site, whether it's waste rock or, or borrow material rock from elsewhere, so that we know how chemically it's going to react. I'm, I'm going to go through now my top 10 issues with proposed mines, and this is based on my experience dealing with dozens of major mines, and, and even now I'm, I'm part of my consulting, I'm helping the Forest Service with two major mines. And invariably, the very top issue is water quality. Um, what, what, what will be the co chemical contaminants? Will there be acid rock drainage? What are the physical contaminants? Will there be sediment and erosion from the site? And then water treatment. Uh, will there be long-term water treatment needed? And if so, how can we avoid it? Obviously, we don't want to get into a situation where we want, we're going to be treating water for a long time. Water quantity. How will the mine uh, design handle stormwater and seasonal runoff? Will it adequately plan for the probable maximum precipitation in an area? We've learned that just looking at total maximum rainfall is not enough because we have areas with lots of snow cover. You also have to consider the possibility of what we call a rain on snow event, where in spring you might have a big thick snowpack and then you get a big warm rain and so you can have twice the volume going down. Have you planned for that? That's, that's the water balance. Um, and then also disruption of surface and groundwater flows. How will the mine affect groundwater and uh, surface flows will, through pumping and reducing the groundwater as part of the operation of the pit, cause springs to dry up and surface flows to decrease. All of that needs to be evaluated and ways to mitigate it found. Um, baseline adequacy, this, I've broken this out, but this really, the baseline we regard as part of the mine design and proposal, but regardless, baseline adequacy um, is the characterization of all the water and other natural resources in an area prior to mining. Characterization meaning we would require, for example, with groundwater, drilling wells to determine uh, the height of groundwater and the rate of groundwater movement and water quality in the groundwater and, and so on with all the other resources. We need to be able to uh, 
the current situation in order to predict how it's going to change and to measure how it changes. If you don't know how you started, where you started, you can't really tell how mining might have changed it. Um, mine design and testing standards, uh, questions about the proponent, the operator's mine design. We've learned that operators don't always have the best ideas as far as mine design and testing standards, and so we question them closely on those. Um, geochemical and geotechnical issues, I've mentioned one, acid rock drainage, but there are other geochemical issues that can come up in mining. Geotechnical issues, uh, stability issues certainly, and, and uh, what, how seismically active is an area that goes into the design of all the facilities, whether or not they're designing to deal with the probable maximum earthquake in an area. Uh, reclamation, mitigation, and monitoring of operation. What sort of reclamation plan is being proposed? Is it adequate for this area? Does it involve using native species? We really think, as Rick said, native species are there for a reason. They, they best survive, so we really uh, push for that. And monitoring of operations is important because under our regulations we can require changes as things go along if we find through monitoring that there are problems coming up. Financial assurance, which we call reclamation bonding, bonding it's, it's really a form of a damage deposit, is something that, that we have gotten very detailed about and, and strict about, and we've learned about that just from having, as I said, experiences with bankruptcy and the like. So how much and what type of financial assurance are we going to go with? Uh, other mine issues, we have a, a lot of uh, wildlife and fisheries, and, and uh, some of those are endangered, so the effects on the native species is important. Uh, the socioeconomics, in, in my state, there have been good as well as bad mining experiences. Right now in Montana, the highest paying jobs are in mining, so it has good effects, and where the mine is good, uh, people are very happy with it and support it. But if it's a legacy issue and problems for the community, they're, they're not so happy. Um, Post-mining needs to be a consideration here too. What will happen after the mine closes? Many of these mines are long-term. They go 30 years or so, but still planning for past that. What is the land going to look like? How is it going to be used? As, as Rick said, is it going to have a productive post-mining use that will be a benefit to the community? Air quality. Um, this dust and, and from, for example, tailings impoundments, exhaust from the mining equipment, all of those uh, are, are areas there that we would question. So what is our process uh, once we identify those issues? Well, as I said, we make sure that we obtain a complete proposal. We go through a lengthy questioning period. We call it a completeness review to make sure Everything we can possibly think of in the way of questions based on experience that the company has provided, including baseline information. The company has to provide all of that. Um, we identify the issues and concerns, and the way that we do that is we have agency experts who review it and who uh, identify questions they have. But we also go to the public, and the public is given uh, open access to all, all of the information and we ask them to comment on it. And they're given, I, I think it's 60 days to comment. Then we'll analyze those issues, categorize or those responses, categorize them, and uh, use those to develop alternatives. Our alternatives uh, include the company proposal, that's one alternative. We also have a no action alternative, meaning what happens if the mine is a proposal as far as effect, and then all the other alternatives are designed to address the issues. So the alternatives are driven by what the issues are. And the issues would get to things like what kind of mine are they going to have? Is it going to be open pit or underground? Is it going to be using a particular type of mining reagent like cyanide? So we'll look at options to that, uh, alternatives to that, and how those might work. But usually it, the alternatives focus on the location of the waste and the design of the waste uh, containment. 
Um, tailings, as, as, as we've heard from uh, Levon and, and from Rick, are a big issue. And so a technology that we are advocating more and more, and that the two minds that I'm advising the Forest Service on, are involving a, a paste or dry tailings. Uh, paste or dry tailings uh, has a lot of advantages as far as you don't need an embankment, a dam that is, you don't have a pond on it so you don't have as much water issues, uh, stability can be addressed. Uh, you, it also, if a company constructs a paste plant for uh, tailings, they, they might figure why not just put it back where they mined it, so backfilling becomes more of an option. So things like that uh, are things we look at in the alternatives. Um, assessing the risks of the alternative components, this is our weighing of the effects. We do use an engineering risk assessment, particularly for different aspects of the project. We look at the likelihood of a failure and the consequences of it and how we can avoid it. It's an engineering approach to looking at risk. We also apply, apply international standards, like I would, for example, I would refer you all to the GARD guide, that's the Global Acid Rock Drainage Guide. It's an international standard, very good publication, it's available on the internet. And uh, I think, in fact, Rick's firm had a role in helping develop that. And uh, that's just one example that, that I would point to. you. But also, our US EPA has a lot of information on this as well. Another aspect um, in allowing public review of this, we, we put this all out in a draft document. We put that draft document out again for public review. And uh, transparency is critical here. I mean, the, the, the public can not only review the environmental impact statement, they can review all the supporting documents, they can even request uh, emails and correspondence that relate to it if they want. So it's, it's a total disclosure. And then they comment again and we revise the environmental impact statement as needed and issue it as a final. We, we require a bond uh, with every mining operation now and uh, beside the one that Rick mentioned, which I, I would also uh, strongly endorse the Nevada model, which again is available online. The U.S. Forest Service has a bond guide that we've developed that's available online and, and I'm putting on a workshop tomorrow at the Ecopian Center on a lot of this and I'm going to be talking about bonding in particular. And by the way, just one more thing on bonding. We do a very detailed engineering analysis and it's basically if the company disappeared or went bankrupt, uh, how much would it cost us to reclaim it? And uh, if we had to just walk in, they walked away from it and we had to walk in. And we include direct costs, meaning bringing in equipment and, and reshaping it, perhaps an engineering redesign, but also overhead. How much is it going to cost us for supervision and so on? Um, here are four recent examples. Uh, I've been involved with most of these. This EIS, uh, four volumes, it, it's in a particularly sensitive area. That's why it's the size it is. Uh, I know size doesn't necessarily reflect quality, but the, these are the size of the documents that we're turning out. This pan mine project here was for a cyanide heap leach in Nevada. Even though there are many issues with that, it's a, a drier area so water isn't quite the issue that it was over here with this project where water was a big issue. And just to give you a comparison in size, this is the size of the environmental document we produced. I would estimate that the permit applications, including the baseline for each of these, was two or three times bigger than each of these. So the company would have had to supply probably twice as much information as, as what's in that. All right. Um, issuing the permit, uh, we take the stipulations from the environmental impact assessment. We provide for monitoring plans and contingency plans from that. Uh, the reclamation bond uh, will need to be collected prior to the permit being approved and issued. Um, we have 
regular inspections, these are specified in the permit, actually, how often we're going to inspect. And uh, we revise, we have a provision to revise and update the permit and bond as needed. If the costs are higher than we estimated, we can, I think it's annually, we at least say the bond will be revised. And then hiring and training agency mine inspectors is critical. Uh, I understand there is a, an Armenian saying, and I, I don't know how to pronounce that in Armenian, but as the translation as I understand it is, one hand will not clap. And I think that is the case here. You can have an excellent law, you can have an, a very well thought out permit, but if you do not hire and train agency mine inspectors to make sure all that happens, one hand will not clap. So, and finally, I, I just, another way of looking at this is as you're building a pyramid, and these are the points I, I've gone through, the project description, baseline, and so on. My point in portraying it this way is that each layer depends for its stability on the one below it. So if you start out with faulty uh, construction down here, you don't have good project descriptions and so on, your pyramid's going to fall over. You're not going to have a good end result. Um, thank you.